Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the intro. I am, I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the market uh, information that we've collected in our research with uh, Gartner, IDC, Forrester, that, that backs up exactly what um, Dick is saying here about the trends. And so what Gartner is saying is that by, uh, they're predicting that by 2020, 70% of application purchases in the enterprise space are going to be uh, built and not bought. Um, and and that's really, uh, as as Dick said, it's it's really because out of the box solutions are generalized, and in the enterprise space, we talk about that every individual company is a snowflake, and you're going to have uh, solutions that cater to the uniqueness. You don't want to force a company into um, changing their processes and methodologies to fit. Uh, an application or a product, you want to have the product that can be changed quickly and easily to um, to fit that company's um, processes. And so, um, but on the other hand, building from scratch is very expensive, uh, prone to a lot of errors, and um, your IT budget um, can be uh, increased by maintaining these traditionally developed uh, software systems. So it's very expensive. And so that's driving these trends that we see uh, in the industry in, in enterprise priorities in that uh, there's a big move, a shift to cloud, uh, despite a lot of, of the hesitations even by um, companies where there's security concerns with being in the cloud. There's still a big drive to cloud. Banks and even government agencies are moving to the cloud, and but requiring the same kind of security uh, that they did do with on-prem solutions. Um, so it, with IDC saying here that by 2018, 60% of new apps will be um, in, in based out of the cloud for enterprise. Um, and to solve the problem about uh, building, uh, we're also moving to enterprise um, platform economy where uh, you're going to go and use a platform that solves a lot of the challenges with building from scratch for you, which is exactly what the Innovation Suite does. Um, and there's also this move to Agile, right, about delivering quick uh, features uh, in a very tight cycles and using DevOps to continuously deliver capability. And the Innovation Suite platform is built all around those uh, specific capabilities. And it's bet, bet meant to solve uh, some of the basic development uh, problems with existing uh, development cycle where the user has a uh, interaction with the business analyst who's collecting requirements in the shape of needs, and then generating those requirements for the developer. And then there's a lot of back and forth between the developer and the business analyst um, to show what progress is being made and adjustments are being made until eventually a solution is delivered to the user, um, which this can be done in Agile, is done in Agile, but um, it still causes churn, churn because as the user says, well, you know what, I have some feedback and I want some extra changes, you'll see that that um, iterative cycle is mostly between the business analyst and the developer, and the longer cycle is between the user um, getting those solutions. And again, here, Innovation Suite is really what we're building and is solving this problem and trying to make it so that there's more value realization at, but to the user um, immediately. And so it's built around these two uh, people who are working together to deliver solutions, the business analyst and a senior developer. And what we see in the marketplace with platform solutions is that either a platform is focused wholly on the business analyst, the no-code development, and um, optimized for no-code development, or focused pri pri primarily on the uh, developer and improving capability and speeding uh, the ability to build solutions by a hardcore uh, pro-code developer. Innovation Suite's bringing these two together and let them co-develop applications in a, in a new way where both no-code development and code development can coexist and be used to build applications uh, seamlessly. And so getting back to this life cycle, here's why we think the Innovation Suite accelerates the time to value. Because the user is going to the business analyst, and the business analyst is delivering solutions immediately. 
the business analyst is building solutions in a no-code way for the user. And only when the business analyst realizes, oh, they're asking the, the developer or the user is asking for something that I don't have in my palette, that I don't have in my toolbox, does the business analyst go back to the developer and say, can you build this extension for me? And instead of building a soup to nuts application, the developer is now building a module, a small condensed module that can be delivered faster in, the, in terms of a component. And then those components can be packaged up into libraries and made available in the marketplace. And then the business analyst is going to the marketplace and finding things and using those without waiting for a development life cycle. So as the, as the content becomes more rich on the platform, there's even a further acceleration of that time to value. And so the developer here, I'll show, I'm going to go through an example of both the no-code development and what it means to add code to extend the platform because it's an open-based platform. You can build your own custom uh, REST services, your own custom connectors to external systems. You can build your own UI widgets and your own uh, custom Java server-side uh, um, application uh, logic. And plug those in in a way that they show up in the drag-and-drop uh, no-code layer. And the, drag and the application in the Innovation Suite, I'm going to end on this slide and go right into the demo because I want to show you how this works. Uh, application development in the, in the no-code is, is split up in a, a traditional software development pattern called model view controller, where we clearly separate out the data from the UI from the business logic. And you build an application in, uh, in an order that makes sense from, uh, I'm going to design from my persona, I'm going to use user-centric uh, design principles, and I'm going to define who my personas are, and I'm going to decide how they operate in terms of their business logic, their workflow, their processes. I'm going to decide what kind of UI that they need to fit their, that persona. And then I'm going to build a data model around that from designing. But when I construct the application, I'm going to construct the application from the inside out. And that's what I'm going to demo for you today. I'm going to presume that we've already done the design from the outside in in this application. It's a very simple application, but I'm going to build something from scratch for you. And I'm going to build the data model and the UI and the business logic. And what I'm going to build for you today is a simple lunch order application. Very basic, but I'm going to build a full application in, an, in this conversation from scratch. I'm going to start with the data. Well, I'm going to move over to the Innovation uh, Studio, which is our UI for our no-code development, and I'm going to sign in as developer. And when I sign in, I'm going to see this workspace and all these applications and libraries. The libraries are uh, collections of components that themselves aren't an application, but they're used for uh, building applications or extending applications. And I'm going to go up and I'm going to build, I'm going to start a new application. And I'm just going to call it lunch order. And it's going to create a new bundle. This is actually in uh, a live uh, uh, environment. It's a developer sandbox that we offer uh, you to go and, and sign up and build for free. So you can go to developer.bmc.com and go and try this out. And here's now my workspace for my lunch ordering app. And as I said, I'm going to start with my data model first. So I've designed my lunch ordering app, and I'm just going to basically say I need to build orders, I need a UI to submit orders, and then I need a process around the workflow of an order, a lunch order. So this is basically uh, employees in a company are going to submit their lunch orders, um, but I'm going to just do it as simply as possible just to show you um, in this, the time we have together, how to build this. So I'm going to build a new record, and it comes, uh, when I create a new record, it comes with a bunch of data. Um, when I create, I'm going to name it, this is my order data, and I'm going to change some of these basic fields. Uh, so status. It comes with a bunch of status, new assigned, um, and I'm going to change these to fit 
my type of data. So I'm going to get rid of all these and I'm going to create new stats. I'm going to say submitted and I'm going to add delivered. Just to simplify it. Now I can build on this later on as I expand the application out, but right now I'm just starting with those for the basic example. And then I also have a created date. I'm just going to change the name of that to make it so I understand what I'm using it for. So that's a date submitted. I also have a description here, a description field. I'm going to call that order details. And you'll see why I'm changing the names of these later, because it'll make it easier when I'm binding between the different layers, the data to the UI, uh, these names will make it easier for me to choose the correct field. And I'm going to add a new field that's going to be date and time, and I'm going to do date delivered. Okay. I have my, uh, my, my um, order record here. So I have my data model that I need. And I don't have any validation issues. I'll show you uh, later on when I'm building something else how this validation works. It automatically starts validating as you build. So you know you built something correct. So I'm going to save this. I know it's valid. I'm going to save it. And now I've got my order. And I can even do here uh, some, as I'm building, uh, edit data. And I'll show you how I use that later on. Uh, so next is my view. I'm going to start working on my view. I'm going to build my UI for uh, submitting a new order. And this is a very, uh, all of these tools are based on um, non-developer uh, principles. So a UI based on this business analyst and the kind of tools the business analyst uses. So this UI editor is based on uh, rapid application development design principles of how you build a, 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 um, a UI for an application. And so um, first thing is, I'm going to do a record editor, and um, I have to name this. So here's my uh, validation issues. It's telling me along the way that I've got some problems. Well, first of all, I didn't name my view. Okay, I've named my view, and now I need to name my record editor. Actually, let's change the view to um, Okay. <clears throat> and I have to bind my view to my data. So that my view knows what data this is for. So I'm going to bind it to an order. And I'm going to do, this is a create mode. And so um, now my record editor knows that it's for creating new orders. And I'm going to use this quick add remove. And I just want to show the order details in here. And remember, I changed the name of those. Now I have, instead of um, description, it says order details. And so it automatically creates the name order details for me. That's what I mean by I'm trying to simplify things for myself. Um, actually, I don't want to, this used a regular text. I want to use a bigger text. So I'm going to actually not use the quick view. I'm going to use this larger text area so I have a bigger area. And now I'm going to bind it to order details. So I've got a bigger text area. And so now I've got my text area to submit my order details, but I need a button. And so I'm going to create a button here. And that will uh, tell me what I want to do with this. Well, I want to create a submit button to submit my order. So I'm going to call it submit order. And I'm going to give it a little plus icon. So for some visual cues. And then I'm going to construct actions. So I'm going to tell it, tell this button what it's going to do. So it needs to save. But it needs to tell me, well, I don't know what uh, you want to save. Tell me what you want to save. I'm going to save the new record editor I just created. And this, this UI here, this expression builder on the right is, a, we call it a data dictionary. And you'll notice next time I come in here, more things will show up. And this is what I mean by it's built around non-developer. I don't have to think about, oh, I've got to save some data here and then retrieve it from there and do things with it. 
as I construct things, they show up and become available for me as, as resources automatically. Okay, so now I've got a save button and it's going to save my record editor. Well, that's great. Now I can submit my order and I can uh, have a button to save it. But I also want to see what orders have been submitted. So I'm going to add in a grid of records here and I'm going to bind that uh, grid to uh, to order. And I want it to show all the orders, but it comes with a bunch of default uh, fields is as columns. I don't like those. Um, again, I'm going to change those to ones that make sense for me to see, which is uh, I'm going to put in ID because sometimes, like if I'm doing a ticketing system, I want to, might want to see the ticket ID. So as a, as a general rule, I'm going to add ID as a column, but I'm not going to use it. I'm going to hide it. But I do want to see the date submitted, and I'm going to keep that visible. I want to see the order details, and I want to see the date delivered. Okay. So how I, now I have my fields. I have my order details. I don't have any errors in my UI. So I'm going to save this, and I'm going to be able to preview it. There it is. So now I can say, oh, and by the way, I'm going to go through things like, hey, wait a minute, I forgot something. And I didn't forget something, but I'm just kind of show you how if you did forget something as you're building, you can go back and fix things. So I'm going to submit a pizza as my order, and I should see it show up. But I don't see it show up. I have to do this refresh to be able to see it show up. And oh, yeah, you know what? I have to tell my button because my button has to know that it needs to refresh. So I'm going to add an action, which is a refresh action, and I'm going to tell it, remember I said things will show up. Now the record grid shows up because I didn't have the grid before. I see a record editor and a grid. Okay, now I want to refresh the grid. I save my view. I preview it, and I say Ember. And there's the hamburger she refreshes the grid, and I see a hamburger. Okay, now I've got my basic uh, ordering view. I want to, and I'm just previewing that view, I want to actually go into the shell of an application. Applications have a shell. They have a navigation. And we provide a basic shell for you out of the box. So I'm going to add a menu item to this shell, and I'm going to call it menu order. And I want it to navigate to a view, and I'm going to pick the Submit New Order view. That looks pretty good. I'm going to save that. And now I can go to this area that says Visit Deployed Application. And I can actually see the real application. Here's what the application looks like. And there's my order view with my navigation and everything. But you know what? I don't really like the layout of this. It's kind of not very exciting. So I'm going to fix the layout real quickly just to show you uh, some of the ease of editing things. So I'm going to add a container in here. I'm going to call it a two-column container. And I'm going to add uh, rich text up here, which is order. I'm going to 
I make it look a little nicer here. I'm going to add another rich text over here. Current orders. And I'm going to move my record editor up here. My grid over here. The other thing is my action button <clears throat> is on the left, and I want to do something interesting. I want to move my action button around, so I'm going to create a button bar, and I'm going to move this action button into the button bar, and I missed it. There we go. And now I'm going to tell the button bar to move the button over to the right. So with just some basic um, changes of my control over the UI and the layout, oops, I'm doing better. Now my app looks a little bit better. It's not just stacked. I've got on my view my new order here. I can see my current orders. And I think that looks better. So now I'm going to build my process for my app. And I'm just going to build a basic process for you guys. Process has a beginning and ending. And this is based on uh, business process model notation, BPMN. And it's a standard, an industry standard that business analysts can become certified in. And it's a great way to, one, easily understand how to build apps, and two, easily understand the workflow of an application or the processes of an application that exists already. So I can easily reverse engineer. Um, I don't have to do any guesswork. I can see what, it, what the process looks like. So the first thing I'm going to do is, well, my lunch order goes from uh, a state of uh, the, from um, submitted, because that's the, its original state, to delivered. And I want to set the delivered date. So I'm going to use our little Swiss Army knife action called uh, user task which basically is a, um, allows me to do something like wait for a status of something to change. So um, wait for delivery. And you know what, I just remembered I didn't change this. It's going to be my order management. The name of it, so I'm going to call it order management. And so from start, I'm going to wait for delivery. Getting back to wait for delivery, I'm going to say, what am I doing? I'm going to look at an existing record. And the type is going to be order. And ah, you know what? I need to make sure that the process itself ha receives an order. So I need to add the input, which is going to be, I'm just going to call it uh, order. It's an input. And it is going to be a type record, and it is going to be a order type. So now I have an input called order. And so when I go back to wait for delivery, and I want to wait for the existing record to have a completion criteria, so I've got to tell it what record to wait for. So I go into my process variable, which is my input, and I'm going to say the wait for, take a look at the ID of the incoming order, and wait for its status to change. And I want it to be set to delivered and see those values that I said earlier are chosen as options here. So I want status to be delivered. Okay, so now that process is going to wait for status to be delivered. Once it passes this step, I want to update the record.
I'm going to want it to set the delivery date. And again, I want to set a record of type order, and I want it to be the incoming order of the process. And I want it to change the date delivered. And I want the date delivered to be the current date and time that that. So once, what I'm saying here is once wait for once it passes for wait delivery, and it's going to automatically set the delivery date to the current date and time. Okay, so now I have my basic process. No errors. I'm going to save that. And the next thing I do is I'm going to set a rule that triggers that process. I'm going to, the rule is going to be based on order. So it says whenever an order, and my trigger is whenever an order is created. So when an order is created, then start a process. And the process I want to start is my order management process. But I need to tell, remember that order management process required an order. So it's telling me, hey, this requires an order. So I'm going to say, well, I want you to pass in the current record. Because this rule is fired on the creation of an uh, or the um, yeah, the creation of an order record. And so I want it to get the current record. Okay, I have no problems with my rule. It's going to fire the process on create. And so I'm going to save that and close that. And now I'm going to go back to my application. And I'm going to add a new Add a new order. And I, the cool thing about uh, processes is I've got a process manager tool. I can see the status of all existing processes that are being run. So I only added that one after I created the process. So now I've got one in an active state. I can see, I can open up this process and I can see what it's doing. Oh, it's on a state of wait for delivery. So I need to change that, remember, to delivered and then it'll move to the next state. So going back to that data management tool, normally in a full process, you would do something like uh, have some external system, like the, deliver, the restaurant that's delivering it, trigger this state change. But I'm just going to, I'm testing this. So I'm going to go into Falafel, and I'm going to manually change it to just show how this works. I'm going to change it to delivered. So I change it to, to delivered. I can go back into the process. I can look at the process. Oh, it looks like it's completed. Now let's go see what happened in the application. And you can see in the application, it set the delivery date. So the process worked, it did what I wanted. That's the makeup of a, of a basic application. Again, it's very simple, but I just built a soup to nuts application for you guys in a drag and drop way. I built the data model, I built the UI, and I built the process around it. And I can continue to expand this out 
until I get a uh, a nice complex uh, application. And I and I have a couple of examples of those in here. Um, actually, I've got a when you continue to build more and more capability, you're going to get a more complex uh, lunch order application. This is part of our tutorial that we uh, have you go through. And so here I have a, a better looking actual lunch order application that normal people might want to use. Here's the available dishes. I can go and select the dishes I want and I can see as I select them, nice information about what restaurant it comes from, what is the dish. I can choose the dish. I can go to new order. I can say I'm going to select which restaurant I want. This is all using more complex data modeling, which is using um, actual associations um, in the system. So there's an association between restaurants and dishes. I can say today. And I've got people in the system. There's me. So I'm associating the order to me. I'm saving it. There's the order. Uh, and this has a much more complicated uh, process. Um, it's got a full order life cycle with things like decisions to make based on uh, what happened. There's a, a cancellation. Um, if the order is set to cancel, it'll throw a, what we call a business error, which is a, a um, drag and drop, you know, no code method of throwing uh, errors or throwing exceptions, which can later be caught. Here's a example of what happened here. Here we go. Here's an example of a process calling another process. Here's the cap capturing of the exception, send a cancellation message based on the order being canceled and so forth. So I can build out a much more complicated process, a, a better, fuller application. But again, this is just all the drag and drop world. I want to show you also how I can extend applications but with code. So this, all this drag and drop layer is not closed off. And it's not just up to BMC to build new capability. Any developer can go in and build something and add to it. And so my example is for this to show you guys is I've got another uh, task manager application here. And in this task manager application, I've got a bunch of uh, people to assign tasks to. And here's my information about those people. That's a nice little form. I want to go into this and uh, wouldn't it be great because if I look at this uh, task manager, it actually uses a library. And if I look at the um, customer data, I actually have an address field. And I've already populated that address field with where that, that person is located. Wouldn't it be cool to have a map to show where they're located as an example? Well, I went and found a Google map uh, Angular directive here. And this is the actual code. I didn't build this. This is the Angular directive that I found. And all I had to do as a developer for this JavaScript is set up the uh, um, explain what the the JavaScript does. It creates a, a view component, uh, which is a map, a view of a map, and it requires some properties to be set, which are the address and the API for Google Map requires an API key, which I'm hard coding, and then it requires a size, what size of the map to show. And so this is all I coded was these properties that the, um, the JavaScript uh, Angular directive required to render the map on the page. And so 
Uh, I deployed that into a library and <clears throat> and I call it geo utility. So here's my map and it created a view component. And if I go into back into my application here and my view, and this is the view, that view of list customers, that's this view here. And here's where the picture of the person is. If I go in here and I see that my geo location uh, utility library has a Google map, and I want to put the Google map right here next to this image. So I'm going to change the container that this image is in to two columns. And I'm going to drop my map next to it. And there's the properties of the uh, new view component that I, custom view component that I built. And it needs an address, it needs a size. So I'm going to give it a size of 200. That's the pixel width. And it needs a, an address. So I'm going to go into my record grid. On that page, there was a, there's a, a grid of, of record CDs that I'm selecting from. And I want the first selected row of the record grid, I want the address. Ah, but I don't see address here. Why don't I see address here? Well, it's not a column in the grid. Ah, so all I have to do is go back, go back to this grid, go to the columns of the grid, add the address. I might not even want to see it, so I'm going to make it invisible so it doesn't change the the grid itself but now it's available as a as a hidden column now i can go back here and i go to my address and i can do the same thing record grid first selected row now address showed up because now that column was added and so again this is what i mean by we're not forcing the business analyst to think like developer Okay, I save that, and I go back to my application here, I refresh, and all I have to do is select the person, and now the map shows up. And so this kind of completes that diagram I was explaining about how the developer, the coded developer, can build these components and add capability to the platform for the no-code developer to add into their application. And that's all I have for the demo. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I think we want to take a look at uh, the contact info for you guys to yeah, and we still and, and Robert, great job by the way. We and we have some time for some questions. So so thank you. And in just a short amount of time, you're able to put together a full blown uh, application. I I loved it, especially because most uh, small com we're a small company, and if we want to order lunch out, typically what somebody does is pass around a, a menu. You write down on a piece of paper what you want, and then somebody has to phone it in. Well, now we don't need to do that. We can we can as long as a, the restaurant will accept an email, we can automate that whole process. So, I you know I know that was something that uh, you just thought of that may seemed a little bit trivial, but it it really isn't. So it, it, there's there's lots of good ideas out there for applications like the one that you just showed us. So thank you. But we do have a little bit of time. I know we said we do about a half hour, but I think a lot of you may have set up, uh, set up an hour anyway. But um, there are a couple of questions, and I did want to just mention a, a couple of things. The, the first thing is, is that I, I think people should realize that I, I think you need, this is like remedy on demand. You, you need, um, when, you, when you order this particular uh, application, the innovation suite, it comes in, in a, a remedy on demand like application. So it's hosted by BMC and then it would connect to your own remedy uh, that, that way. Is that right? Is that how that works, Robert? That's right. And it comes with, I didn't even show integration service. There's a whole 
uh, no code and code capability to build um, integrations with external systems. They kind of build once and reuse many times. They, again, connect, we call them connectors. They show up, these uh, connectors show up when you create them or when you use them, they show up in this drag and drop in a process and you can say in your process, go reach out to this external system and perform some action or uh, go listen at this external system and wait for something to happen and tell me about it and then I can proceed. You can do things like that. I didn't even get into that aspect, but um, so that's how we uh, have integrations. We have remedy connectors built out of the box for you so that there's a, a very tight and easy way to integrate with existing Remedy and Remedy okay. forms. Yeah. And, and then the other thing that I think is, is kind of exciting, too, is that you already have developed your own application called Business Workflows uh, on the Innovation Suite. So it kind of gives organizations a head start if they wanted to maybe do a facilities or an HR app, you know, maybe 80 percent of the work's already been done. Right. Is that is that a good way to look at that? That's exactly right. So business workflows is, as I was saying, right, the more robust content that's out there, the more that developers are building these components, um, the more rich and the more and the, and the easier it is to, uh, to build your application. So instead of um, building from scratch, we built business workflows as a line of business uh, workflow management application tool to be able to do most of the grunt work for you in, in building a workflow-based application. So, uh, like you said, if, if human resources or finance or any other department within your company needs a workflow uh, processing type application, you can use the business workflows and just do some minor tweaking to get it to work for your specific line of business that, that's needed. Okay. All right. Well, we do have some questions that have come in. So let's run through these. Um, the first question here is, um, hi, Robert, can you show how to create a log for the run and see the logs in the config tab? Sure. There is a logging capability. You're going to have to go back to share your screen. Is it not sharing again? It's got, it, it has a PowerPoint up. Hmm. I might be having some connectivity problems. I don't know what comes back okay. up, but there is, right. there is a uh, administrative uh, capability. It's so, oh, it's up. Okay. So all the getting back to, there is an administration capability. And so there's a uh, logging uh, capability inside the administration um, area here. So here's, I mean, here's foundation data and um, the way you configure foundation data. So there's the logging. I am having okay. network problems here. Okay. Well, you can just talk through it. And why yeah. don't we move to the next question then? I think um, this one you just can answer. Is this platform intended to be an eventual replacement for the current ARS ITSM platform? No, it isn't. Um, it is meant, so we have a lot of faith in um, Remedy. It's, it's been around uh, uh, quite some time. It has a lot of history. It has a lot of powerful capability in it for IT service management. And Innovation Suite is not meant to replace Remedy or ITSM. Uh, it is meant to augment ITSM. So if you want to build something uh, new to solve for new use cases beyond ITSM, we uh, recommend using this tool and building your new uh, application to solve for those use cases to extend ITSM and to, and to um, improve it. In fact, we're doing the same for, uh, with a couple of other capabilities. We've got a, um, we're doing some things with uh, digital workplace where we're using this capability to expand, extend uh, the, um, what was formerly called MyIT to be to the workplace, to have more capability. We're using this ourselves. And we're also um, have a new uh, product out to handle uh, multi-source cloud, um, uh, a way to manage 
uh, ticketing, kind of to, to do order orchestration between multiple ticketing systems uh, using the, this multi-cloud tool that's been built on Innovation Suite. So it's handling um, orchestrating orders between uh, different ticketing systems. So for example, if you have AWS and uh, AWS is generating uh, tickets for you, instead of having your um, IT service management team go into uh, Remedy and manage tickets separately than AWS, the tool, you can, all the, all the tickets from AWS can come into Remedy and you can use a single uh, pane of glass kind of interface in Remedy to manage tickets in multiple systems. Okay. So it really is meant to, to augment or extend uh, Remedy in new ways that, that Remedy wasn't intended to support. Okay, thank you. Next question here is, what's the format of the exported bundle zip file? Is it, I think your question is, is it binary format? Can we see its content in a readable format like XML or text? Do you yes, understand that? it is. Yes, it's a, it's a readable format and it is uh, based, it's got basically all these objects are uh, JSON. So this is all, all the drag and drop capability here, all the no code uh, capability here, all the objects are um, represented as JSON. So it's a, uh, a file that contains uh, JSON, actually a number of files. So the zip contains for every object the JSON definition for that object inside it. Okay. And then the final question here is, is the business workflow code available in the sandbox that you had pointed out earlier? No, it isn't. Um, it, is, it is not meant to be developed. So the, the okay. developer sandboxes are for building custom code. Right. And, uh, but you can um, request a, a BDC instance with, with business workflows in it to okay. demo it. So okay. I would reach out to your uh, SE and uh, talk to an SE about uh, requesting a BDC instance with business workflows in it. 